you're down to numbers at the end of the day. You need to have a business structure. You need to have a business plan. You need to move your step in a way that they're not random. At the beginning, uh, uh, they are because you need to find your path. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I have the great pleasure of speaking with Nenmar, who are an award-winning multidisciplinary design-led practice. They've got an extraordinary portfolio of work which spans across multiple sectors from retail to high-end residential and it's all guided by a very clear design philosophy which becomes very present in the sophisticated realization of their beautiful projects. It was very interesting to speak with the two directors Gianluca Nencini and Elena Maresca who got in contact with us here at Business of Architecture because they were very keen to share their story of starting a practice. I think they started back in 2019. And in this conversation, we really go into a lot of depth of some of the challenges and the successes, how they overcame them, and what it's actually like to start a practice in today's climate. And I think it's you know, there's a, a unique set of challenges in this particular era of starting an architecture practice, which they cover. They talk a lot about being a married couple and what that's like. And I think that comes with its own unique set of challenges and opportunities. And I really want this conversation to serve as a reminder to lots of other young practices that are in emerging practices that you're not alone. And often when we talk about business, particularly when architects are talking about their business to other architects, it's not always as a transparent conversation as it could be. And we always only ever see the kind of shiny looking finished products on Instagram or on websites, which is all beautiful and wonderful, but it negates the real stories and the challenges of, you know, how do you make projects profitable? How do you go about winning work? How do you market, market your practice? How do you deal with a client who's changing their mind all the time? And we keep on finding ourselves saying, yes, how do you deal with overwhelm and stress? How do you still manage to have a work-life balance whilst running an architecture practice that becomes all-consuming? How do we get around this tension or this apparent tension between the business side and the creative side of our our businesses. So this is a really interesting conversation. Um, Gianluca and Elena were very transparent, very open, and kind of gave uh, a lot of insight into what they've done and the things that they're still facing. Uh, and, I, and I hope it serves as a really fantastic conversation uh, that we can continue here at Business of Architecture. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Gianluca Nencini and Elena Maresca of Nenmar. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Gianluca, Elena, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And you, Ryan? I'm very good, thank you. Well, good, thanks. Fantastic. Thank you for having us, really. Absolute pleasure. Very excited to be speaking with you guys. Um, emerging practice uh, in the UK, doing some absolutely incredible work, beautiful portfolio of residential projects. You're um, under the name Neymar. Um, Nenmar? Nenmar. 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 I was getting the footballer in my head there for a moment um, in my ear. <laughs> and 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 I, I think that, that you know we were we were just talking before I hit record here about you know being a young practice and you guys set up Jan Luca you were saying 2019 so I set up my uh, so I used to work for a practice here in London a really good practice uh, based in Notting Hill and mm -hmm. I decided to go solo in 2019 and open my own practice and then in 2020, we start up our um, our joint venture between uh, Maris Cantiers uh, that was uh, part of the Elena. Uh, so yeah. Maris Cantiers was um, Elena's and Elena's sister practice where they were focusing on interior design and an art dealing. So because in terms of their heritage, they're half Italian and half Brazilian. So they used to uh, do a lot of like a Brazilian art dealing uh, as uh, Italian one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found ourselves uh, in the middle of two projects, two big projects. One is the new building in Trancoso, and, uh, and the other one is the penthouse in, uh, in Cellerina, Switzerland. 
and uh, we really enjoy to work with, I mean, together. And that's, um, I mean, usually architects really hate interior designer, but uh, mm -hmm. I think <laughs> I think it's really important to. Uh, so our message is really to to deliver a product, a service from conception till completion um, for the end user. That that's really our um, our aim and our goal. Amazing, and and so and so you guys. Jen, look, you started 2019 and then Eleanor, you came in a little bit later. Yeah. So basically what happened was that we had uh, our own company and then we tr we merged. We merged. Uh, the My studio I was see, Mersk okay. Interiors and then Jaluka has his own studio called the GN Architecture. So we mm -hmm. merged the two company in one to give like the mm -hmm. 360 service to the client because with these two projects, we understood that... Uh, it's also better to engage this kind of two professional figure that you work together since the yep. beginning to the end of the project. Of course, we started not in the really beautiful period 2020, but uh, we managed mm -hmm. after COVID, Brexit and everything else that happened to deliver some good project. And we are happy that our practice is going in our, we think the right direction with, for our kind of style and goal. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's a actually, you know, starting a practice during a, a global pandemic the or, worst. The worst. or, or, <laughs> or during a recession. <laughs> these, are, these are pretty difficult situations within which to actually, you know, start a business. However, however, on the other side of it, there is a kind of um, silver lining, if you like, in the sense that if you can survive, it make you stronger. You know, exactly exactly yeah. and it's and it's and really we talk about it in business a lot this idea of adversity and how important it is because you got to develop your thick skin somehow because running a business isn't for everybody it's not for the faint-hearted it it demands a lot of a lot from you you're taking on an enormous amount of risk you're the one accountable for everything you're the one being held responsible you're the one that if it, you don't get the work done and completed then you don't get paid you don't pay your rent you know if you're when you start taking on team members now you're responsible for paying their mortgages we don't you know people forget this is the this is the the, the large responsibility that kind of gets placed on a practice owner and it can and it can take its toll if you like and it's yeah, not yeah. for the faint hearted so there needs to be this kind of resilience that's built up and sometimes we just don't have it we don't have that kind of resilience sometimes people have had whatever adversities they've dealt with um and they they've got that kind of emotional fortitude but i i do think like setting up a practice in a difficult situation if you can survive those first few years we've seen it in 2008 so many really strong practices that you know we speak and look at and admire uh, now they all were kind of forged if you like in the fires of the recession of 2008 yeah. um, and and so many of the business lessons were learned in that period so um what were some of the the kind of challenges for you guys I mean, that's, that's the funny thing. I mean, because I mean, when you start with that kind of situation, you really start from scratch. So whatever is mm -hmm. happening, I mean, it, it's worse. I mean, but I mean, it can't worse than that. That, that yeah. That's the main point. Don't and say it out as loud. As you say, like a key word is, <laughs> I mean, meaning in terms of business way. I mean, uh, when, when you start from the very beginning, I mean, in within a pandemic, and then you got, of course, like a Brexit. And uh, of course, you are, uh, you are Italian. So you are in, uh, in, uh, in, I mean, you are in a in a kind of uh, region and a land where where you don't know anybody, uh, mm -hmm. and so you need to actually make you you need to make your space your own space, and uh, to then start with connection. So to actually gain trust, because I mean trust and resilience. I mean those those kind of keywords are really really important when you start up from from the very beginning. So. Yeah, so I think there was. I mean, the first bit it was to actually put in place and. Uh, uh, our why um, so that was our main goal at the very beginning so understanding how do you want to be seen from from the outside so start from the foundation and then to build up the company that that was uh, our main main goal so and i think i mean the pandemic helped us a lot because we could focus on that and uh, 
and then in terms of like a website and um, brand strategy and uh, we work with a really really good company uh studio small um that they're they're amazing uh, they're really amazing we went to them and they really help us through um to actually gain what we want to 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 to, to convey to people mm-hmm. uh so that i mean yeah it was hard hard time uh, but at the same time we uh i mean it was helpful inverted comma right uh, because it, i mean sometimes depends. when you it are depends. inactive because uh, for in that period, for instance, for us, our client, the first client that we got, it was the friends of friends, like that you go to dinner, you introduce yourself, and then you end up meeting with new people, and that guy needs to do the job. And with pandemic, zero of that was happening. So from a certain point that you open your practice and you think that it's going to be hard, of, of course, but you think that the 80% mm-hmm. of your time, you're just going to do whatever you, your job, like to be an architect, to be an interior designer. With the pandemic situation, we, in like one month, we had to be lawyers, uh, economics, uh, um, social media manager, PR, an event, uh, know something that we didn't know any clue how to do it. Also like this Instagram, not Instagram, social media, not social media that we, we start every day is a school day for us in that period because we said, okay, and now, as you said before, uh, we need to do money at the end of the day and <laughs> we're not going to survive with hair. So how can we find new clients where when you can go out? Because we, we, mm-hmm. our name, we, we hope that in 10 years' time, our name is going to be super well known that people, they're going to just call us because of our style and our... Uh, the, our service our why i mean our, our, our why yes but today we we are i'm not saying no one because it's a strong word but we are a little practice in a notion of a uh, practice they're doing yes. similar thing that uh, w- that we are doing and now that with also this also kind of social media kind of um situation that we've got at the moment the competition is even higher than before because th- when you when you were talking about two thousand and eight, uh, it, they didn't have also these issues that we've got today because before <laughs> the competition was local. You uh, you were like competing with the yeah. if you were from London with the practice of London. We are competing with the practice of Kuala Lumpur, Ghana, Mexico, Italy, Milan because people are they are bombarded of images all the time and they 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 can choose mm-hmm. from everywhere in the world. So. This is what mm-hmm. yeah, even the press. It, I, I mean, it got worse. Yeah. I mean, in terms of publication, etc. So it, it get harder and harder. I mean, previously you were chosen to 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 publish that kind of project. So everything, of course, is much more simpler from mm-hmm. from the eyes of, for example, my parents or so for that kind of the generation. Mm-hmm. But I mean, really, is it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's more well, challenging. It, 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 it's, it's interesting. It's it's interesting. There's there is certainly greater, fiercer competition and talent, and technology has lowered the bar in terms of of who can be educated. So education, you know, on all areas in all sorts of arenas of of business, for example, and architecture, are you know you can you can watch Harvard lectures, for example, online yeah, yeah. these yeah. days, or there's untold amount of business education and resources that are now available at the click of a few a few buttons and the 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 cost if you like of actually starting a practice is lower than it's ever been before and you know you've got access to outsourcing um work to you know to take advantage of of like a team who's working in india for example and I find this quite interesting when we're seeing, you know, lots of young practices being very creative in how that they're they're kind of assembling different parts of their of their business and using and utilizing technology and also coming up, you know, a fresh with a fresh pair of eyes of how to package and market architectural services. Yeah. Um and, it, and, it, and, you know, and also the kind of crossover collaboration, like what you guys are doing with interiors and architecture in the same under the same roof, if you like, um, this becomes quite interesting. And of course, there's, there's a there's a wider 
pool of competition as well that that uh, accompanies that. Um, so I guess the, the question is, like, what were some of the innovations that you started to to look at to help differentiate yourself from other practices? So in terms of like, uh, so social media, we found of ourselves that we are, uh, I mean, we are, it's quite tough in terms of social mm -hmm. media, as we were saying, because I mean, it, it's difficult. I mean, even the algorithm of Instagram, it doesn't really work nowadays. So in terms of like a, I mean, it doesn't mean if you don't get likes, you know, I mean, we used to have this kind of thing in mind. You need to get likes in order to actually get higher up in the ranking and then to be, mm -hmm. to be seen. But it's not that easy anymore. Uh, so mm -hmm. in terms of uniqueness, so in our, our, we approach in terms of, in terms of marketing, we, we spend a lot of our resources. So I would say that a good 50% of resources we, we invest in marketing, but marketing can be, it can vary a lot. For example, we had few projects that didn't go through, but we really, mm -hmm. really happy about that kind of proposal. So we decided to go and, and do CGI's. So then we have our collaborator that we are working together in order to actually get the right CGI's and then to convey to people what could be. You know what I mean? And then, for example, um, approach somebody else uh, that could be on the same kind of branch of, let's say, if it's a retail, uh, and say, I mean, that's that's our project, and and do like a, some some of design pitches. So that kind of line of marketing. Um, so we invest a lot on that, and uh, uh, and uh, it, it, it's working. Uh, it's working because at the end of the day, even if you didn't build the project, it's really the idea and. Um, and how you how you solve a problem to 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 somebody, and how you actually uh, create a cohesive stories from their brief and uh, and the constraints of the of the space itself, mm -hmm. that is uh, very interesting. Great. Um, so, so how how the first kind of clients that you've kind of started to work with, how did they come into the office, and how are you finding work now? So. We have been really lucky at the beginning. Uh, so we, we, I mean, because luck in our practice, in our, in our field, in our industries is really, really important because, I mean, you need to get trust. You need to, I mean, to, in order to actually get trust and be known of what you actually, of what's your why, you need to have somebody that give you really big amount of trust. Mm -hmm. And at the very beginning, we had like a friends of friends for the house, uh, for the new built house. And then friends and family. I mean, at the end, of, at the end of the day, that was the the our our clientele. Um, and uh, so we have those two big projects. And then from then we actually generate a, a really good two outcome where actually we get lots of press. We had a lot of press on Cellerina, and we had the really good press on 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 the new built house. Mm -hmm. um, so and so we invested a lot with uh, with a PR agency. Uh, in order to actually get out there. Uh, and that was really it uh, at the very beginning. Yeah, because right. like, okay, so um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, at the beginning, we make the decision that everything, not everything because we need to survive, but good 50 or 60% of our income was going directly mm -hmm. to this kind of or PR or marketing, even like paying Instagram or whatever that was putting ourselves out there. So at the beginning, like the first like period, the amount of um, money in our bank <laughs> wasn't so high because we decided that at, when you're young, you need to invest. Because, um, mm -hmm. for instance, we saw a lot of friends of ours that did the, the same kind of course of study that we did, of, especially Gianluca, that is an architect, that at the end of the day, they're not even doing architecture. Because it's so mm -hmm. hard for them, one, to open a practice and find the client that, as Gianluca was saying, give you the white canvas to make you express your talent. Because a lot of time, mm -hmm. clients want just a puppet. And when you are um, really young, like us, they think it's mm -hmm. easier because you're not so well known that uh, the, 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 they can come to you and uh, they just want you to do what they want. That's it. Without your in input whatsoever. So a lot of yeah. them, they decided to change completely job and do something that is not even related to architecture because they found themselves with a dream that it was crushed mm -hmm. by this kind of event. So luck, as Gianluca said, it was like one of the main uh, 
topic point that we had at the beginning because you need to be lucky as well that to find two clients that they give you like not white canvas completely but a good 80 percent of give me your idea you're young i trust young people mm -hmm. i want to encourage young people to create to 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 express themselves this is something mm -hmm. that is really hard to find and um yeah we managed to do it and then resilience and yeah. don't give up I mean that that's really a, I think the main the main point and then always be open to learn mm -hmm. because I mean it's a as you as as your podcast says is a business of architecture I mean it's not I mean you need to really detach yourself from what is architecture at some point mm -hmm. I, I'm more of, of a dreamer uh, between mm -hmm. the two and Helena she's more the reality check uh, uh, director um, so. Um, but it, it's really important. It's, I would say that is more than 60%, 70% so, of your time. Is so, so it's really encouraging to hear that, you know, you, you, uh, you were savvy enough to invest 50% of like what everything you were kind of earning back into marketing and creating, arch, you know, marketing collateral and hiring a PR agency. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that kind of stuff, if done well, and I'm sure you, well, I can tell from your websites, you hired, you know, the best photographers and did, you didn't cut any corners with that kind of no. um, work. And that's, that's something that we see so often, particularly when in startup practices, you know, the project fees were so thin, there was barely anything to hire a photographer. Um, now, okay, you finished a piece of work. Um, and, you know, certainly as well, if you've, if you've been uh, fortunate enough to, bring in as, as your first couple of projects something where you're able to put a personal stamp on then absolutely now's now is the time to kind of capitalize on that and then take it to magazines and and um and, and publications um you you were saying there as well that there's a kind of a, a learning curve that emerges in terms of the business aspects of the practice what have been some of the things that have been surprising to you shocking or unexpected for me everything i mean for me from the since the, the from the very beginning i mean accountancy i'm, I'm i mean numbers I'm, i love numbers i love proportion but i mean when we talk about numbers and financial number i'm the one i'm, I'm the one so, i mean she, she she is the one so i i'll i'll leave i'll leave it to you elena i mean yeah, this yeah, answer yeah. just like that so basically uh when someone opens a studio if it's related to art and design i'm just speaking about like this kind of creative field it thinks like like it's like mm -hmm. opening like a pottery kind of studio that you're just there doing your things and then you go home and you're happy. No, this is not what happened here. So it's just <laughs> it's just opening a shop. It's opening something like whatever kind of practice all over the world. So not you're down to numbers at the end of the day. You need to be a business, have a business structure. You need to have a business plan. You need to. Uh, move your step in a way that they're not random at the beginning uh, uh, they are because you need to find your path so at the beginning you need to try a few roads and then assess yourself but uh you i mean our luck it was that also my one of my background is studying business so i knew how to do it in a way i knew how to create a business plan i knew how to uh, liaise with this kind of kind of taxes and all this kind of contract that you've got in place because to be honest if you give contract like that or like this kind of number without any help to people that study something completely different than uh, economics and business or law it's quite mm -hmm. hard to understand them because at the end of the day you need to give it to the client and as you said before you rely you are real reliable of everything is on you the contract needs to and be... And there is not much of like, a, um, I mean, any kind of class during the university. I mean, I'm speaking about architecture. I mean, I studied in Italy. Uh, I mean, there are lots of like uh, all the finance around and the QSing about the project. In Italy, we do it in the university, for example. I don't know if we do it, if you do it here uh, as a part of your studies. But, uh, but in terms of like how to run your practice, uh, of course, it's not something that they would expect from somebody that leave uh, architecture, maybe, maybe in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But no, I, I think, I mean, they're not really focused on giving you that kind of input. Uh, that I think it's really, 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 really important. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean this, is, this is definitely one of our criticisms here of uh, business of architecture, yeah. of architectural education in general. I mean, there are some very forward thinking universities in the UK 
um, University of Manchester. I've been yeah. incredibly impressed with in terms of their business, you know, what Rob Hyde has been doing there um, and their kind of business education and just showing the breadth of innovation of business within an, within the architectural world, I think is absolutely, you know, imperative and how business influences architecture and how everything that you do as a designer is inside the context of business yeah. um and um the london school of architecture as well another progressive school that's kind of opened up um, a much more healthy conversation around entrepreneurialism and running a business and you know how it actually you know how how the functioning profession sits inside of a commercial reality and you know in general in architecture school i mean i'm a big kind of critic if you like of saying that most architecture schools are a business themselves and they're trying mm -hmm. to put bums on seats and they need to fill up the courses and they make the courses popular therefore they do what they think is the fun stuff um which is primarily design but and it's often led by academics who aren't professional who aren't practicing not always but you know there's a big chunk of um um and it's and there's a kind of attitude that prevails of like, well, we're at university, we've got to protect creativity. Therefore, let's not talk about money. Um, let's not talk about all these other sorts of real life things that happen in architecture. You can deal with that when you're out in the professional world and you'll learn it there. And but for here now, let's have fun and and kind of keep a purity of an idea, which there is there is there there is a lot of sense around that as well in in, in one hand, but it also it misses out. On an enormous amount and it ends up making us unintentionally um business averse and when you come to set up your own practice then it's like oh goodness i wasn't and now i wasn't expecting We're this no, no, i agree yeah. i agree I totally agree no but it's yeah, yeah. It's i mean like, i've been uh, for example um some some go ahead there no no the, 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 i mean like a lot of friends of ours also like they've tried to open their practice and after they bump in this kind of problem they said no i need to freelance for someone else because it's i mean too italy much. is different eh? no I no mean, but here i was speaking a year in london no no, no i was speaking like of, of people that we know here in london they said mm. look we've tried but it's so much because also in terms of time <laughs> consuming how, how consuming it is and and I'm telling it because I've studied it. And for me, maybe, maybe, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm genius of it, but it's easier to understand numbers because I've studied them. But for someone like, for instance, Gianluca, I'm speaking from for, your, for, for you, but you struggle yeah, when there is like I mean, things yeah. like that. You struggle. So you, you're like spending hours trying to understand the mechanism behind, it, behind this kind of a, a huge Excel with all these numbers. And you're like, and now? I mean, I need to hire someone to explain mm -hmm. to me what happened. And uh, maybe you don't have the money. You don't have the time. You don't have all the energy to all the information. And I think, as you were saying, it's massively important that when you're in school, they're going to teach you at least the basics. Because my dad, he works in like business. And everything he said to me, like, you need to have economical basis to do everything in life also running the house mm -hmm. Elena, everything like you need to know the <laughs> basics of it and then you can do whatever but if you don't know them or you do the, i don't know the painter in the middle of the jungle and you want to live like that super happy in the nature or whatever you do at the end of the day if you've got x amount of money and you spend more than that or you do messy stuff around it with taxes and everything else you are not in a good, really good position. So mm -hmm. if you don't teach people how to do it, it's really hard to open a business and succeed. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's interesting, um, you know, the kind of dictum of um, form follows function, you know, versus form follows finance. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And, 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 I, and I think that's a kind of that's I mean, you, you, you become very aware of like when upon entry into the profession of architecture that there are all these other forces at play. And yeah. the biggest one is money. Yeah. And I mean, face structure to do a, like a fee proposal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, that's that's <laughs> that's mental. I mean, it took like a, I don't know how many <laughs> to actually get it right. And I don't think we got it right. I don't still. think so. Um, but, <laughs> it, it, no, I mean. That's the main problem because mm -hmm. I mean when you when you when you approach it, I mean it's gonna be too much. Shall I invoice now? Mm -hmm. I mean that that kind of situation mm -hmm. where, I mean at the very beginning, it's uh, it's really it's really hard to uh, 
to give a, a, a reason behind it and uh, to have a, a sort of like a good fee structure behind it, um, it it's really important. Really, really important. And also because... When did, you, did you... Did, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, please can continue. Now, is that like also with this kind of oh. creative world that we're working in, always speaking about money, people don't value your profession as the other profession. So when you're asking for money, they're like, are you charging so much? Like, I mean, yes, I'm charging that much because I study. I've I've got like X amount of years of practice on my back. Uh, and because they think that you are something that they can use for what's they don't see the business value, the adding on that you're giving to the property, to the commercial space, to to things. They they see it with maybe huge names because they say, ah, okay, cheaper if mm -hmm. they did it, so the house is going to value 20% more. But the design-led kind of practice that we are, they don't see this kind of investment in our fee, something that they yeah. can... Unless you explain it. Unless you explain it, a fee, a fee proposal stage. Yes. That, that, that is what is sometimes... We do because I mean you need to actually trigger that mm -hmm. that kind of uh, it's it's a mindset as well uh, because they don't know uh, and that's the main problem in general of what is around they don't know what an architect that what an architect can do and what is the time spent for just a simple task I mean up to planning mm -hmm. or I mean just it's it's insane. Did, did you guys have any mentors or were there any other architects who were you were who were older and kind of uh, you know it, more seasoned you know they they had their practices for 20 years who you've been able to go and kind of uh, ask questions of or what what hap I mean, what happens when you know you guys have got questions to ask and who do you go to um, so I, I go to my dad. I mean, I'm, I'm a third generation of, uh, I mean, my dad is an architect. My granddad used to be an architect. Oh, Funny story. this is perfect. But, in Italy. And, but in they're Italy. back in Italy. Uh, so in Italy. And uh, it was totally different at the time, Ryan. I mean, my granddad, if you think about it, his registration number was number two in Tuscany. So <laughs> if you think about it. In right, terms that's, pretty, of, that's, that's pretty cool, being number two architect in Tuscany. Number two in Tuscany. So they were like a sharing the cities, uh, I mean, as they wanted. So you do that kind of plot, you do this plot. And I mean, in terms of like, a, it was totally different. And uh, I mean, now in Italy, Italy is not in a really great uh, position, let's say, yeah, where design-led architecture practice, they're not really, I mean, it's difficult. It's a difficult, it's, it's a difficult word um, and a, diff a difficult approach in terms of architecture, unless you go in North Italy, in Milan and big cities or where it's more international the mindset. But just getting back to your question in terms of uh, where do I go to? I go to my dad that, of course, he got his experience is an experience based in Italy with uh, lots of developers. So it's not really a residential or a high end retail mm -hmm. client, but I get the sense of it. So it's uh, it's really let's say it's an answer from from a, from a, from 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 his experience so he he got it it sounds like you both got some wise parents there who've been given good who have been given good advice on this we don't this tell thing. them like Very all good. of it because yeah. otherwise they're going to be like a bit worried like what are you doing no 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 don't worry don't worry it's all, all fine <laughs> no no it's well, doing it, 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 so, and another another question then obviously you guys are both uh, italian why London as opposed to Italy? And what, what brought you to the UK? Well, we've got two completely different stories on that are based on both backgrounds. Like Gianluca is from, he's going to explain your, his part. I'm going to explain mine. My family is really, <laughs> really, really international. My mom is Brazilian. My aunt and uncle are Japanese. My mom came from Brazil. She married an Italian guy. Then my sister both are living in Switzerland, one with a Swiss guy, and then she moved to Sao Paulo. We are all over the place. So when I was 18, I didn't have a choice. I said like, or New York or London, you're not going to Italy. Like, because if you're in Italy and you're in a small town, I'm from Genova, you get used to stay in Genova. No one is speaking English. The mindset is super close. And mm -hmm. as a three girls with my sister, we struggled because we couldn't fit there. We said, okay, but we know that there is something else. And for them, there isn't. So I didn't have an option. There was the option A, you go to London, which is the, the nearest one. And, and you've got your, at the time I had my sister here. 
This is this, is, this is Genoa um, Renzo Piano Land. Yes, correct. Yeah. Renzo it's Piano his. Land. It's his. Uh, <laughs> it's his, it's his neighborhood. It's his, it's his neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but in terms of people that are living there, like in Italy, uh, uh, we've got e each region and each city has got its own kind of character in terms of people that are living there, and. Genova is super famous that are super close and if someone else from Genova is coming in no one is going to speak to him <laughs> they're gonna mm -hmm. they're gonna like avoid the, your presence so my dad said okay you're young and the only thing that you need to do when you're young is travel explore you know Brazil because your mom is Brazilian so half, half of our life we spend there so try something else my sister went to Australia and then to Switzerland and I went to Brazil and I this, they said I'm going to London with my expectation was to stay a few years in London and then move. But uh, it happened then after like three, four years, I opened my first practice. And when you open a practice also is harder. Now it's easier, like as we were talking before, maybe to stay one month in Paris, one month in Trancoso, one month, whatever you want. But before it was more stuck, the situation. So mm -hmm. I started the business and I said like, look, I'm going to stay here. And... I'm, I just continue to stay here and I'm, I think I'm going to stay here for like a long time. But <laughs> for Jaluka situation, it was, uh, he's going to explain the opposite than me. Yeah. So I, uh, I mean, when I graduated in 2000 and I think back in 2013, um, I actually graduated in Genoa under the Polytechnic of Turin. Right. Um, yeah. And, uh, and uh, I mean, but I didn't met Helen in Genoa. No. I met her in London. And uh, so I moved here. Uh, because so first of all uh, so at the very beginning i wanted to do like a, a sort of experience but my main goal was that italy for me was not enough i wanted to give like a, a sort of like a dot com to what i had back in italy and not to be recognized as a the son of or the grandson of and uh, mm. you know i mean when mm. you finish when you when you when you terminate your studies i mean you're not I mean, you don't know what you want. You don't know what is your purpose. I mean, in terms of architecture, uh, I mean, I had to go to somebody else and to actually learn who I am mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like um, what I want from architecture, what, what, what I think, uh, what, what, is our, what is my why in terms of, uh, in terms of it. And so I, I moved to London. Uh, I didn't have, uh, I didn't speak one word in English. Oh, wow. No was it was insane it was hard wow and I still remember microstation i mean i started with microstation i used to work in revit in the university and I started with microstation i didn't know one word i didn't know what to do and of course i don't know if you know microstation it's totally different i, I was yeah I, I, I used to be a scene. i used to be a heavy microstation user back in the day <laughs> i lo i loved it then at, at the end of it but look i mean reference for me reference i didn't know i mean what was it it was totally different and uh, the, of course, my language barrier was was very very hard, um, and then I stayed. I mean, uh, I found this practice where I actually felt at home, and I learned a lot. It was a small practice, um, and uh, but very very into details and uh, resolution of it. So it's actually you get the reason behind, and I, I loved it. So it's really. Uh, you understand the purpose mm -hmm. for it. You know? did, did, uh, and did, did, you, really... did you did you take English lessons when you got here, or did you just pick the language? I did. Up? I did. I spent I spent two weeks. Uh, I spent two weeks. But the funny thing that my my boss, my old boss, uh, so he he used to have a house in uh, in Italy. Mm -hmm. So he said when he, when we when we when we when he hired me, he said, "Look, I'm gonna learn a bit of Italian, and uh, you're gonna learn English. <laughs> so let's start with like a six month." <laughs> internship and <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was the excuse it was the and, deal <laughs> uh, uh, but then of course and then of course it just lasts a lot six seven years i guess yeah so it was it was a nice journey wow that, that, nice. i mean that's that's amazing i mean i'm i'm um learning french at the moment and i'm here in here in paris and just appreciate the the magnitude of you know taking for granted a, a language and then entering into a different you know yeah. space and place but certainly professionally as well and kind of throwing yourself in there and not speaking the language and then making your career work that's you know that's i, I think that's incredible 
it's hard. It's really hard. And if you if you ask me, I, I speak much better in technical mm -hmm. when we speak about architecture and uh, on site uh, and any kind of building regs, etc. When we speak about day to day basis, I mean, and crap, mm -hmm. and crap. Sometimes I say what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, you can't really put one word next to the other. That's that's really. So because I, I learn English doing architecture, that's, that is fun. <laughs> so that's good. Your English is proper architecture speak. Proper, proper. Amazing, amazing. So um, obviously you guys are a married couple. Yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, <laughs> no. Oh, no, it's great. I and mean, working great, together, obviously. But so. no, uh, depends which day you're going to ask us this question you're going to give us like different answers but at the end of the day how are we doing the, today uh, we're, we're to doing change. well because we're into different kind of <laughs> you don't know the background is different no i'm joking uh <laughs> the important thing that from day zero we we decided to merge the practice and we were married so i mean we, we know that was a big step but at the end of the day is like the um, knowing uh, your place in the company so when we're talking about mm -hmm. we, we have the brief initially to have like ideas running together like working on the final concept together as a team but then fight, I fight fight, fight. fight. <laughs> but this is marriage so no, I think it's knows, but it's 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 fine. Is, uh, it's <laughs> we fight it's but but uh, then uh, when it's down to uh, the architecture part I totally trust Gianluca and mm -hmm. uh, uh, he's following that part. And when, whenever it's like down to the other section of the work, that sometimes it can be like um, a, a fine line where I start and when I finish. But we try to set up this kind of workload at the beginning of the job. So we try to, you do yours and I do mine in a, in a way that no one... And then is. we meet in the middle and we actually generate the proposal together. That is what is uh, the beauty of it. And as a married couple, I mean, we speak about lots. I mean, I think 80% of the time we speak about what, what's what's about Nenmar, really. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, you know, it's always quite nice. Uh, and I, I grew up in a family where my dad is the architect and my mom actually always... I mean, uh, let's say lunch and dinner, you get, I mean, bombarded from, uh, I mean, problem with clients, uh, problem with the planners, problem with uh, whoever it is. And I mean, sometimes, of course, I mean, you need to uh, have a, a quite good common sense to understand what's going on and you can give the right answer, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and, but I mean, I, even uh, with Elena, of course, I mean, we, we, we sit down and we can discuss it and I got somebody that can understand and we can, uh, I mean, solve a problem together that is great um and i mean funny enough business wise it's much better if you think about mm -hmm. it i mean you are two director based on the same company and uh, i mean it's just us uh as the director so it, it's great um mm -hmm. and but we are really happy about how is a how is it formatted in terms of like um, architecture interior design so she got her own meetings i got my uh, mine and then we generate the proposal together and do, do you have completely independent clients sometimes so clients that um you know they're not doing any architectural services they're just purely in the interior interior yeah, yeah. Um, domain can person. happen but um depends but also. it's a fine line as, as i was saying before is a yeah, fine line because like for instance uh there are these huge interior kind of renovation kind of project that they, they still need like to to have his involvement in it, um, mm -hmm. and, and interior architecture of it. Interior so at that point, I still get involved. So uh, it's, yeah, of course, it's, some of them they're like more fun for his side than others, and and the opposite way, like one way or the other. Uh, but uh, we we try to find clients that uh, that we try to find clients the clients that we had today they they manage for us to work both in the same project yeah i mean in this concept we responded really well i mean they understand the benefit of having both of us involved because of course i mean in terms of fee proposal as well there are two separate fee proposals mm -hmm. that is important to mention i mean for 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 this matter that um when when then I mean, they appreciate, for example, you start to uh, develop the, the proposal 
of whoever is going to be the space, uh, how you're going to live with it. So in terms of like a finishes, in terms of like a fixed feature or it's like a built-in joinery, anything that is going to go within it is going to be a, 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 a all-around service uh, from the beginning. And so, and they appreciate that is very, um, it's helpful and uh, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a good it's a good approach i mean we we are happy with it at the but moment but it's also easier at the end of the day also for them to approach just one practice and like don't don't say like look uh, Gianluca speak with this practice elena and try to find like a point in the middle to 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 give me the solution and then one is lay and that the is other is impossible sometimes it's impossible so. because if you find a, by my previous experience, you find yourself in the middle of the project where you actually, where the client hire an interior designer. And of course, there is going to be some clashes. I mean, it's, 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 it's impossible not yeah. to. Uh, so that, that's why uh, we came up with this uh, approach. Fantastic. And, and how has the practice um, grown involved in terms of staff? Are you working with freelancers and contractors or do you have full-time staff members now? So we got three freelancers here mm-hmm. uh, in, uh, in UK and we got the two collaborator, external co- collaborators that are, of course, accountant and then, uh, sorry, we got the PR and then we got also uh, a CGI uh, collaborator. Um, and then uh, back in Italy, we got uh, other, because the idea is to, at the end of the day, we would love to have, uh, let's say, under one roof, uh, one two team that one that can work for Nenmar, one can work from uh, from my from the Italian side. Mm-hmm. That would be the ideal scenario. Um, uh, so have just one headquarter. But at the moment, how we split it, we work. Pre- I mean, freelancer base because like uh, also because here. like again down to economics uh, to hire and have like people on the salary you need to have a certain flow of project that you know that you're comfortable like hiring people because you want to consistent because when yeah. you hire someone you want to hire someone that you trust that has got your the same eyes that you do that is not so easy though you don't hire someone on the road because it's cheap because it's not gonna give you the same result that you want to achieve and you want to trust them completely because you're giving mm-hmm. them your client in your hands and you don't want to redo the work from scratches so at at this stage even if it's a bit more expensive for us, it makes makes much sense to have freelancer based on project yeah, instead no, I, of I, having this huge commitment that at the end of the month we don't know maybe if we can. I know absolutely. I think that's a, that's a very wise solution, and I think this is one of the one of the advantages of of kind of setting up practice these days is that you know it's a lot easier to find contractors it's easier to work with people in different countries yeah. and have kind of remote remote working and it makes a lot of sense as a young practice to kind of keep like that i mean you can build a business to a million pounds worth of revenue and beyond using a purely hub and spoke or contractor model yeah. if you like and not have full time um, staff members and it makes it very lightweight for you as a business yeah. you know in, you know if, if if all of a sudden a handful of projects suddenly stop you're not having to scramble hitting all the decks trying to bring more work exactly. in. you just put a pause on people's contracts or you know and you give them flexibility as well yeah. because uh, that's really another thing that is very important we are i mean after covid we realize how important mm-hmm. it is I mean, have your freedom, uh, have, uh, I mean, be, be wherever you want. Well, and, the, uh, do... I mean, I think this is, this is a really important point is that, you know, that there's a, there's an increased desire for, um, remote working and flexible working hours. And really, I mean, I kind of think a lot of that kind of, that kind of in the context of a, of a business, you know, if you've got employees who want that, then that's great, but it comes with additional responsibility. And it comes with additional accountability. And also, usually it requires a lot of, you know, it's the most skilled people that are able to have that freedom and flexibility more readily. Um, And if you want to have that yourself, then being a contractor is perfect because then you can choose your hours and you can work two days a week if you want to work two days a week. You can take four months off if you want. Um, You can work wherever you like in the world. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing more and more people move into that as a lifestyle decision as, as, as well. 
Um, and it works be- It works very well for both parties involved. Yeah. I totally agree. 100%. Totally agree. I mean, hours, times, I mean, uh, yeah, business hours, uh, they're overrated in my view. Uh, I mean, I used to, I mean, when I was studying, I used to work during the night and I'm still like it, uh, <laughs> working during the night rather than during the day. Uh, so it's, um, it's funny, but it's, um, yeah. I, I totally agree with you in terms of like a f- giving the flexibility for for everybody. But it's, uh, because, it's, I mean, it's at the not end of the day, easy. Yes, but uh, business is business, but it's important. I, I think that young people can get this kind. Of, we we get it. We are young. We've got like our own things to as, as well. But for instance, if you speak with not say like parents, parents in general, not in general mm-hmm. because I don't want, but our parents. I put our parents in this line. If you tell them that their employee, they're gonna work wherever they want. They're gonna not have like the lunch break. They they can not come to the office for two days. They're gonna look at you saying like, "What?" But no, sorry, no, this is not the way you work. You work in the office, and you we try to explain to them, not really, not not, not really anymore. You can work because whatever they want them. because I mean, for them and also not used to it. if they try to find my dad is almost retired he's 72 so he doesn't i'm not gonna try also to explain to him because like in two years i hope for him that he's gonna be on a beach drinking mojitos but (laughs) if they want to hire someone and these kind of young people ask them for flexibility they're not gonna hire them in italy unfortunately they're a lot like that still because it's a bit different the situation very close mindset. Yeah. That's, the, that's the main problem. Yeah. I mean, we are still got the the, the lunch break mm-hmm. that is uh, from one to three. So one to three. Yeah. If you think about it, that three, when I well, come I, back, I, I mean, I, I, I think, I, I think it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting kind of generational and uh, kind of time that we're in with this, you know, with this idea of much more flexible working hours. And I, I do think like if you're an employee and you want those, those, that flexibility, then, you know, the model of being an employee is that you get your salary comes in very comfortably every single month and then you get all these other benefits and perks. And if you want the the freedom and the flexibility, then it it should come with a risk, if you like, which is the risk of being a contractor. And I think an employee, uh, yes, as a, as a, as a, as a, as as practice as we yeah. are, for example. I mean, you got the same kind of approach. Uh, so you got your own risk and you got your benefit. It's... Uh, Either or. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. Very good, very good. Um, I know again another another thing why I think working with contractors is so is so valuable as well is that often contractors, you know, they are essentially running their own mini business themselves. They're very cognizant of time. They're very cognizant of getting stuff done and delivered, and you know, there's an efficiency that can kind of come come with it as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it all. Yeah, it can, it can be very, very, uh, very, very beneficial for everyone involved. So, what one thing that I would say that uh, I mean, what I, sometimes it's really hard to find it because I mean, what we are after is uh, somebody that is part of the team. So I don't like to be, let's say, I mean, it's my design. So for me, the, to actually a design proposal, I like it to actually build it together with the team. You know, uh, I mean, I don't like just my eyes. I need somebody, a third eye, somebody that. It's outside of the proposal in order to actually shape it at its best. Um, you know that that's really uh, and sometimes it's very difficult to find uh, the main. Uh, I mean, good good uh, freelancer that are focused on that kind mm. of thing. Yep. <clears throat> very good. So, what does uh, the rest of twenty twenty three have in store for you guys? So at the moment, um, like our business at the at, at the moment, how it is shaped is um, Alf Residential and Alf Retail. So we just finished mm-hmm. um, a retail shop in Walton Street, uh, which is a kids shop that we gain after doing the Emilia Wickstead shop uh, just around the corner in uh, in. Um, <clears throat> Zone Street, and uh, now we are working in a few residential projects, big residential project, or in London. And our hope is with again business, uh, the business PR and marketing, and da da da, to do more work abroad. Because uh, strangely enough, we started our business with zero project in London, and they were all abroad, which was oh, also really? the fun of it. Yeah, because we started with one in Brazil and one in uh, in Switzerland. 
but we really enjoy it because in the same time we were working in the Swiss kind of uh, kind of law and everything is super strict and yeah, super and, easy uh, also to understand to the Brazilian that you can understand. Like I mean, it was amazing. It was, Brazil is amazing. Brazil, not not São Paulo, but it's a small town on the on the on the beach. It was like they don't know what wow. the computer is. I think more or less. Again, <laughs> well, like... again, another one of these amazing benefits of, of kind of you know starting a business now is that you it's yeah. like like we've said you can be working all over the world. How how do you deal with things like you know professional indemnity insurance when you're working? Certainly, at the beginning of a of a business, like how, what do you what do your insurers say to you? Uh, it's tricky. It's, I mean, it's it's really tricky. tricky. Lots of questions. Lots of questions. A lot of lots paper, of and we because we need to be as precise as we can, and uh, and also yeah. with the interior design part, there is also furniture involved. Like yes, <laughs> so you need to be like to to have the right one. We, we've got. Um, an agent that is helping us with the best quote and uh, and uh, mm -hmm. setting the best insurance for us. But you need to be really precise because we want to be covered. We, there is no way that I yeah. want to go to Brazil because there can something can happen happen easier than other places because like their the safety the time, is not their priority. Let's put like that in these kind of small villages, not in the main cities. Sure. So uh, we've uh, we've we struggled a bit to have the right one, but after like a couple of months before starting the jobs, we we end up having like the the, the perfect plan that is covering us all over the world. But each year we need to re-update it with the mm -hmm. new project that we're doing, following our needs in, in the direction that we're going. Amazing. But one thing is, I mean, either for Bra for Brazil and from Switzerland, we had the two local architects. So at the end of the day, yes, the PI insurance would needs to be amended. But at They've the same time, I mean, you got somebody. Yeah. Correct. So you got their own cover. Uh, so that that's really uh, another thing that needs to be considered. Amazing. But it's very funny. I mean, how I mean, those two different. Uh, world, I mean, Switzerland and Brazil, how, how funny it was uh, <laughs> between like a building regs and uh, I mean, in Brazil, you can do whatever. We did everything. Uh, we designed everything. I mean, there is no system in that mm -hmm. house in terms of like a, uh, insulation. They're not really strict about it. And um, we, we submit for planning application and they came on site and we gained planning application when the house was built. <laughs> If you think about it, the building like, was. That's, that's, that's every architect's dream. You're like, we don't no, have to deal with it. No, but it was insane. It is. It, it insane. is. Brazil. I would love. I mean, I would love to build more in Brazil. But they they, they went on site. I mean, Marcio Kogan. If you look at Marcio Kogan, I know it's on your on your website. There, you got one of those the images of one of the Oscar Niemeyer um, recliners. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. This is one Video. of the uh, paces that uh, mm -hmm. I used to deal with. But it was funny to do the works in Brazil because in Switzerland, they always like all dressed the same with helmets, with super professional clothes. We went there, they had the um, Panama, the, the sun hat with the helmet on top and the shirtless with the Havaianas doing the cement. <laughs> and we were like, is it legal? Yeah, don't <laughs> worry. Fica tranquilo. And I, okay, okay, we go. Like, <laughs> but it was so fun. Amazing. So. Our oh, dream is to see other, even other places to understand also like the way they build, because it's also important to know how other country, the issue that they've got, the way that they're building. The, it, it, it's a learning process. So it, we want to, the, our dream method, I mean, is to, everything. to do something abroad as well, like also, in, I don't know, Asia. Wonderful. Brilliant. Well, Gianluca and Elena, thank you so much for your your insights and just sharing your journey so far. Really, really fascinating and just amazing to see so much talent and enthusiasm and for you guys to be so open and kind of candid about your experiences and the reality of um, setting up and growing a, pa uh, growing a practice during a global pandemic. Thank you very much for having us. <laughs> thank you us. so much. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment 
except to help you be unstoppable.